we're going to be looking at the five different types of chemical reactions. We're going to be looking at combustion, um, synthesis, decomposition, single replacement, and double replacement. Uh, we're going to look at both the reactants and products associated with each of these reaction types, um, as well as learn how to predict products uh, for each of the different types. Combustion is the first reaction type that we're going to look at. Combustion is the burning of any substance in the presence of oxygen. Um, so if we look at this uh, generic example here, you notice that oxygen O2 is one of your reactants. Um, your reactant, other reactant gets converted into a new product. The products that you have will contain oxygen. So if we look at the generic example down here, okay, we have oxygen gas, we have another reactant. Um, oxygen is in this product as well as this product. So the combustion is the burning of any substance in the presence of O2. Now, when we're looking at the prediction of products associated with a combustion reaction, um, we know that those products are always going to contain oxygen. Now, we typically refer to combustion or um, identify combustion reactions as those uh, reactions that occur when hydrocarbons are burned in the presence of um, oxygen gas. So, um, hydrocarbons are any substance that contains carbon and hydrogen hence the name hydrocarbons, okay, and the products that you will always get from the burning of um, a hydrocarbon is carbon dioxide and H2O. So if we look at the example here, C3H8 and O2, we have two reactants. We have a hydrocarbon, and we have it in the presence of oxygen gas, okay, CO2 and H2O are going to be our appropriate products there. Why? Because it's a combustion reaction, and anytime we combust a hydrocarbon in the presence of of oxygen, we get CO2 and H2O. So the combustion prediction uh, activities are pretty straightforward. You see a hydrocarbon, you see oxygen gas. Um, it's pretty much most likely going to be a combustion reaction. CO2 and H2O um, are the products that you anticipate getting there. Our next reaction type that we're going to be looking at is synthesis. Um, so synthesis uh, is basically the creation of something new. Um, and in this case, if we look at it, uh, the combination of uh, two or more um, substances come together to form a new substance. So basically what you're anticipating here um, is multiple reactants and a single product. Um, so a synthesis reaction, you're going to combine more simplistic materials and create a more complicated uh, product. Uh, when we are predicting products um, for synthesis reactions, uh, if we're dealing with ionic um, products, it's very, very easy to predict your product. However, when you're dealing with covalent um, compounds or um, covalent products, it's going to be a lot more difficult. Um, so when I talk about the cross-down method uh, for the ionic substances, what we notice here is that our reactants, we have a metal and we have a non-metal. So when we're putting those together to form a, a product and performing a synthesis reaction, all we're going to do is we're going to take our um, metals charge, okay, so we know that's plus one because of what we know off the periodic table. We know chlorine has a negative one charge when it's, the chlor when it's in its chloride ion form, okay. We cross down those ions and that gives us NaCl, okay. So you're predicting products. Um, if you have a metal and a non-metal uh, for the synthesis reaction, you can subsequently predict your uh, ionic compound that you're going to produce from that type of reactions. Covalent molecules uh, are usually more difficult to tell. Um, there's not always a straightforward method to predict the products. You can come close usually, um, but overall you need to um, uh, take the covalent predictions uh, with a little bit uh, less uh, intensity. Decomposition um, is basically the reverse of the synthesis uh, reactions that we just looked at. Um, so decomposition, when you think of leaves decomposing, uh, they're going from a more complicated molecule structure, or excuse me, molecular structure, and basically breaking down into its original elements. So decomposition, it's the breakdown of two or more substance, or excuse me, the breakdown of a substance into two or more simpler substances. In these types of reactions, you're only going to be having one reactant because that's the complicated uh, molecule that's then breaking down into the simpler um, substances. 
So when we're looking at uh, decomposition reactions, um, predicting products is relatively easy when we're dealing with binary compounds. Okay, all you need to do in that situation is break it into its elements, elemental forms. Okay, so KBr, right, so uh, this ionic solid here, um, we're going to break it into its potassium and, and bromine components. Um, in this case, notice that uh, we, we break down potassium into its elemental form, which is just K. It's a nice um, content solid. And we know that bromine in its elemental form or its natural form is Br2. Um, so that's going to give us our products. Uh, when it's something that's other than a binary uh, molecule that is breaking down, um, it can get a little bit uh, more dicey in terms of uh, predicting your product. Um, however, metal carbonates, uh, which we see an example here, they typically break down into a metal oxide and carbon dioxide. Um, so basically, you know, one of the oxygens stays with the calcium uh, and one of the oxygens, or excuse me, the other two oxygens stay with the carbon and you subsequently get a metal oxide and carbon dioxide. Uh, you're going to be asked these types of questions. Please be very familiar with the metal, uh, metal carbonate uh, decompositions. Those are commonly seen um, all over uh, reactions and uh, predictions of products uh, throughout exams. So single replacement reactions are what we're looking at now. Um, in single replacement reactions, what you have is you have a compound, and then you usually have something um, that's in its elemental form. Okay, And what ends up happening is one of the substances in the compound get replaced by that other substance in the elemental form. So basically, you have a swapping of places. So notice we go from a BC molecule to now an AC molecule because the B and the A have replaced each other. Okay, And now the B is in its elemental form. So um, basically, if, if it's metal that are doing the replacement, right? the metal is going to replace whatever was positively charged in here. Okay, if you want to look at it from the non-metal perspective, um, the non-metal uh, would be replacing the thing that's uh, negatively charged. So here's a common example, um, or a relatively um, nice visual uh, example here. Um, we have a copper solid that's been stuck into a um, silver nitrate solution. Okay, what ends up happening here is your um, silver and your copper are going to replace each other. They're going to swap spaces to give you copper nitrate and silver solid. Um, so basically, one uh, positively charged ion is being replaced by um, a new ion that's positively charged. Um, you get a new compound and a new element. So basically, it's just a swapping of places. So how do we predict the products for single replacement? It's actually pretty easy. Um, when we look at the elements that we have, okay, we have our elemental iron, it's a solid, okay, and we look at the compound that we have for the single replacement reaction, we know that um, iron is a metal, so it's going to form a positive charge, um, and we know that copper in the copper sulfate compound is a positively charged ion. So we know that these two are going to replace each other. So they'll swap places, they'll give you your new compound, which is iron sulfate, and a new elemental copper solid. Double replacement is related to single replacement um, in the sense that uh, there is a swapping of ions. Okay, um, so when we have two different compounds, okay, the cation from one compound is going to swap um, and become partners with the anion of the other compound um, and vice versa. Um, so basically you start with two compounds and you end with two compounds. So when we're looking at double replacement reactions, um, we're actually looking for kind of a specific set of rules or a specific set of um, uh, conditions in order to get this uh, type of reaction to occur. Okay, so um, a double replacement reaction, um, first things first is you need to have two compounds, but they also must be soluble. They must be aqueous solutions of those compounds. Okay, so if we, if we look at these examples here, um, we have our lead nitrate potassium chromate, um, and those two solutions, notice there's no solids, everything is in their ion form, everything is floating freely and happily. When we mix these two solutions, okay, that contain these two compounds, what ends up happening is that the ions um, 
that are insoluble come together. So notice that one of our products here is a solid, and that's the precipitate that we see here, this yellow solid that's kind of starting to crash out of the solution. Okay, that's this solid product right here. Notice that I have um, another product that is um, soluble, so basically those ions are remaining in solution, um, while these from the solid product are crashing out to form a precipitate. So basically, in order to get a double replacement reaction, you need to start with um, basically two compounds that are soluble in water, you mix those together, and then one of your products must be insoluble. Okay, so the combination of those specific, specific ion types will cause that. So in order to predict our products, what we're going to do, um, we can either switch our negatively charged ions or positively charged ions. It really doesn't matter how you choose to do it. Um, you can look at it from the perspective of, you know, your nitrate and your iodide, excuse me, iodide swapping places, okay, or you can look at your lead and potassium uh, swapping places. But basically, you just change partners and you look at your products. What you then have to look at is find out if your product is insoluble, okay? So what you're going to do is you're going to look at the solubility table um, that's in the brown LeMay book. Um, there's also one uh, a few slides down that you'll be able to reference to figure out is this soluble or is this soluble, if one of them is insoluble, you know you're going to get a double replacement reaction. Okay, in this situation, um, with the sodium nitrate and potassium iodide, okay, when these swap places, okay, there is no precipitation um, based on the solubility rules, so you don't get a double replacement reaction when you mix these two aqueous solutions. So this is just a generic solubility table. There's multiple different ones to look at. Some are more detailed, some are less detailed. Um, but the way you use this is basically what you do is you look at an ion that's present. Um, you look at an ion that's present in a compound that you're looking for. Okay, so um, if I look at the example here that I've written on the side, I'm going to look at the ion that shows up on this side over here. Okay, so iodide um, is the ion that's in this compound. So I come over here to iodide, okay, soluble. So what it's telling me is that it's soluble. However, I need to look at the exceptions, okay? So in terms of exceptions for solubility, except uh, silver plus one, mercury, and lead two, okay? If I look at the metal that's here, it is in fact lead two based on this compound, okay? So in fact, this compound would be insoluble, so it would precipitate out and form a solid. Um, if we look at another example, let's look at um, Ki, right? Okay, once again, iodide is what's present. Okay, we pick that, um, and then we look at the exceptions to the rule. Okay, so silver, mercury, lead. Okay, notice that potassium is not one of the exceptions, so this would not precipitate out. This would stay in aqueous form. Um, you can do that with any of the ions that are present. Um, it just depends on how the chart is uh, organized. You need to make sure that you are uh, memorizing uh, your solubility chart. I would look in the LeMay book, Brown LeMay book, um, in order to do that, although this is a pretty good um, solubility chart as well. Okay, so let's go ahead and let's look at uh, some predicting of products, some practice here. Okay, so if we look at this first reaction here, the initial thing that I'm going to look at is what I have. Okay, so I have C4H10 and O2. So in this case, I know that I have a hydrocarbon because some compound that's made of carbon and hydrogen is by definition a hydrocarbon, and I have oxygen. Okay, so most likely this is going to be a combustion reaction. A combustion reaction of any hydrocarbon is going to give me CO2 and H2O. Okay, so this is a combustion reaction. So I've been able to predict my products, okay, based on the reactants that I've been given, um, and I've been able to identify the reaction type. So let's go ahead and let's move on to this next example. Um, notice I have a um, very, uh, I have elemental forms, okay, of my reactants, okay. Um, basically the simplistic form, the simplest form present here is going to suggest to me that I'm most likely going to be um, undergoing a synthesis reaction. Why? Because I'm starting with the basic form, the most, the simplest form of each of the reactants. So I'm going to get MgO as my 
reactant. Um, how do I know it's MgO? Remember, um, when I'm forming substances, right, it's going to, and it's going to be an ionic compound. I use the cross-down method. Okay, magnesium forms a plus 2, oxygen forms a 2 minus. You cross those down, you get Mg2O2. You reduce that down like you would for um, any other ionic compound when you're making formulas um, by this method. Okay, and you subsequently get MgO as your product. Okay, so synthesis is what we have here. Okay, notice in this situation, um, in this next problem, I only have a single reactant. Okay, a single reactant should be suggestive of the fact that this is most likely going to be a decomposition reaction. Decomposition reactions go from a more complicated molecule into uh, molecules, or excuse me, into the simplest form of the components of that molecule. So in this case, it's Na, okay, and N2. Because sodium is a metal, it, it likes to hang out um, in its elemental form, while N2 is one of the seven diatomics, and that's how it naturally likes to occur um, in nature. So this is a decomposition reaction. I've identified my products. Okay, this fourth reaction here that we're going to look at, okay, notice I have one element or one item in its elemental form, and I have a compound. Okay, that's usually going to be suggestive of a single replacement reaction. Okay, so your single replacement reaction, okay, notice this is iron. Iron is a metal, so it's going to form a positive charge. So it's going to replace um, the positively charged ion in the example here. Okay, so um, if we look at the example here, we're going to get FeNO3, okay, and copper solid. So single replacement. Easy, easy. Okay, and that brings us to our last example here. Okay, notice when we take a look at these uh, react, uh, reactants, notice we have a compound that's soluble, another compound that's soluble, so we have two aqueous solutions. Okay, um, so if this is in fact a double replacement reaction, okay, their uh, metals are going to replace each other, or you can look at it from the perspective of the um, negatively charged anions are going to replace each other. However you want to look at it is fine. Okay, so this is going to give us PbI2 um, plus KNO3, okay? And then what we would do is we would decide, is this a uh, double replacement reaction or not? Okay, and the way we would identify that would be to look at the solubility table or to use our memory and identify, hey, is this a soluble solubility rule exception? Okay, so in this case, we talked about earlier, we talked about PBI2 being insoluble, so it's going to form a solid. Okay, so KNO3 will be aqueous. So this is, in fact, a double replacement reaction because you get a substance that uh, precipitates. So this is a generic predi prediction of products for each of the reaction types. It obviously takes practice. Um, it takes getting used to, so it's not something that comes naturally, um, but it's something you want to be practicing uh, throughout the um, time that you're studying chemistry.